All right, we're going to start talking about brain tumors a little bit this morning. I hope everyone had their breakfast because everybody loves brain tumors, right? That's the first thing you think about when you uh, open up a case that might be a brain tumor. So in general, if you're not really super familiar with brain tumors, uh, we're going to talk about some of the general approaches on how you're going to deal with that. Uh, rather than the peek and treat, what we're going to talk about is what you can do to try to figure out what exactly it is that you're looking at. And so some of the general approaches that we're going to use, we're going to talk about whether something is intraaxial versus extraaxial because that really makes a big difference in terms of what our differential diagnosis is like. Whether something simply looks like a mass and is mass-like or actually is a mass, that makes a big difference as well. And then ca other characteristics that are helpful are infiltrating versus circumscribed, enhancing versus non-enhancing to some degree, diffusion and perfusion, as well as a little bit of genomics as well. So what we're going to do is go through all of these things and apply them to a bunch of different cases so that you can understand how to get through brain tumors without actually getting scared. So in general, when I think about extraaxial, our extraaxial differential diagnosis is generally limited uh, to primarily things like metastases, meningiomas, or what used to be called hemangiopericytomas, but are now solitary fibrous tumors. And I'm going to separate this from intraventricular tumors as well. Intraaxial, again, in many adults, we have metastases, and we have many different primary brain tumors as well. And occasionally, those extraaxial tumors will come intraaxial. Uh, as well, and so we'll see that. So if it's important to figure out what's intraaxial versus what's actually extraaxial, how do we do that? Well, the easiest thing to do is first see if it's extraaxial. So with an extraaxial mass lesion, because it's not in the brain parenchyma itself, it will be separated from it. So there will be usually be a CSF cleft. So on this T2-weighted image, what you can see is a rim of CSF around this extraaxial mass. So this clearly cannot be in the brain parenchyma itself. And secondarily, what you will see is there's some displacement of some of the subarachnoid vessels as well. So this has now expanded the subarachnoid space immediately adjacent to it. You will also see, such as on this T1-weighted image, both the CSF cleft here around the mass lesion, as well as cortex between the mass and the white matter. So here you can see that the white matter is deep to this, and then there's cortex in between that. And sometimes you will also see a dural tail, such as here, where you see that the broad dura uh, the dura is broadly thickened, and there's a tail along either side. So now how do you decide if it's intraaxial? Well, the easy answer is, well, it's not extraaxial. Pretty simple, right? So we have something that's completely surrounded by the brain parenchyma. So in this particular case of a glioblastoma, what you see is this infiltrative irregular mass lesion, and there's brain parenchyma all the way around. Here you can actually see that the cortex is involved and peripheral to the lesion itself, so it has to be inside the brain parenchyma. It is not extraaxial. It has none of those features that we talked about. Things that are also potentially useful are things such as circumscribed or infiltrative. In general, most metastases are going to be well. Here's another area, I'd like the cranial nerves, that if you don't have a lot of uh, contact with basal ganglia abnormalities, you don't read a lot of these neural cases, that they are a bit daunting. But if you think about it, just like we did with the cranial nerves in terms of a systematic approach, it actually is kind of fun. And uh, just having an overview of the pathophysiology of basal ganglia abnormalities, I think goes a long way toward helping you have more confidence when you look at these and, and enjoy them more at the same time. So the basal ganglia, the so-called extrapyramidal system, has an extremely important role in motor control, controlling what our, what our motor cortex wants to execute it modulates that so that the motions are carried out in a smooth, effective fashion. Uh, there's a lot of interconnections that give rise to this. Uh, you know, it, it's just so easy to think about the, the corticospinal tract. I initiate a movement up here, this hand's moving. But what goes on for that to occur in that you know, fraction of a second, literally, is a lot. And these are very highly metabolic structures. And so they're susceptible to certain uh, insults, especially in childhood. Uh, there's both excitatory and inhibitory functions, very important in modulating that fine motor control. And if you deprive these high metabolic, you know, little engines of their substrates, oxygen, glucose, and minerals, and things they need to function, bad things happen in terms of symptoms, but also uh, you can get uh, physical insults to these structures, especially again in childhood. So you look at this and it looks pretty daunting. All these structures of the basal ganglia and their interconnections, here's the anatomic subdivisions of them. But the, the overview is keep in mind that from the cortex to execute motor activity, 
The modulation that occurs with this extrapyramidal system has both excitatory and inhibitory functions that help modulate it before it ends up going out to the spinal cord and to our extremities. And uh, so this is what results in the various symptoms we see with the chorea, the hemibolism, et cetera, uh, from these nuclei having dysfunction or pathology that compromises that function. So the corpus striatum is the caudate and putamen, uh, the globus pallidus, the lentiform nucleus, of course, here with the um, putamen and globus pallidus, substantia nigra, and subthalamic nuclei also play a role. So the caudate nucleus, we see the head of the caudate here, very familiar. It forms the contour, the heads or the, the, of the lateral ventricles. Uh, you can see the head of the caudate there and the frontal horn being formed by the contour from that caudate head. I'm going to talk about MR angiography with and without contrast agents. In my own practice, we do a very heavy volume of CT angiography that's grown over the years. Um, however, MR angiography has a vital role, role to play in our department, and there are many instances where CT angiography can't answer a question or there's some reason not to use it. So it's still a very important uh, player. And also, technically, there are a lot of challenges with this that you have to familiarize yourself with and your techs have to familiarize your, themselves with to, to do a good job with this. So just to put a little historical emphasis on this, um, I have been involved in the field of MR angiography for a long time. This dates back to when I was a fellow at Mass General in 1985, when I was like two years old. So, uh, but at that time, you look at this image and you say, that looks awful, right? But that, this was a game-changing image because for the first time, we were able to use MR to take pictures of the blood vessels in the body. So that was very exciting. That was done with a rather primitive pulse sequence. And then uh, eight years later, Martin Prince, who's now at Cornell, uh, did groundbreaking work showing the feasibility of using contrast agents, uh, gadolinium-based contrast agents, to perform MR angiography. Again, totally routine now, but back then this was really quite a new concept. And so, uh, and of course, the rest is history. So, Contrast enhanced MR angiography is fast and it's accurate in most applications. And we can use it for evaluating the vasculature. And as I'll show you, even though CT angiography does a great job for most things and is very efficient, there are a lot of things where the combination of MR angiography and other techniques such as flow imaging uh, and wall imaging gives you a lot more information than you can just get from CT. So the basic principle I think you're all familiar with is that paramagnetic contrast agents such as gadolinium-based agents um, shorten the T1 relaxation time of blood, especially during the first pass of the contrast agent. Uh, not, not much different from CT. We use iodinated contrast agents with CT. We mostly image during the first pass. Same with MR. And this pro provides excellent contrast between the blood pool and background because the blood has a very long T1 to start with, over one second, and that gets shortened to less than uh, a tenth of a second uh, after, during the first pass of gadolinium. Other tissues such as muscle and fat aren't much affected during the first pass, and when you use the correct sequence, um, you get beautiful images like this. This is a volume rendering of normal renal arteries, and this is done with a